Good morning. I am Beth Tigges, STTI President-Elect, and I welcome you to the seventh presentation of the International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame. Before we begin our, to honor our 2016 nurse researchers, I invite prior International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees who are with us today to stand and be recognized. It is very special to have you all with us today. The International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honors Sigma Theta Tau International members who have achieved significant and sustained national and or international recognition for their work and whose research has impacted the profession and the people it serves. Today, we are honoring 19 distinguished nurse researchers. The honorees were selected by an appointed review panel with exemplary research expertise. Each nomination included documentation that provided evidence of contributions and impact on nursing research as outlined in the award criteria. The presentation of the International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame is sponsored by Wiley. On behalf of the Sigma Theta Tau International Board of Directors, I thank Wiley for its continued support. Wiley works with STTI staff and editors to publish the Journal of Nursing Scholarship and World Views on Evidence-Based Nursing. At this time, I welcome to the podium Wiley Publishing Manager, Cassie Stovall. Thanks, Beth, very much. Um, I'm delighted to be here today. In 1922, the founders of Sigma chose their names from the Greek words storke, tharsos, and time, which I'm sure you all know. It was new to me while I was preparing the speech for today. Those words mean love, courage, and honor. The inductees sitting here on the stage embody these fine, fine words in everything that they do and all that they have achieved. And Wiley is enormously proud and honored to sponsor the 2016 Sigma International Nurse Reacher Hall of Fame. Wiley was founded in 1807 and by the early 1900s was established as a leading publisher in science and technology. Like Sigma, we have been in the business of supporting science and research and the professionals who do great work for the past 100 years. Sponsoring this award gives me great pleasure and I know that Wiley appreciates the opportunity to support one of Sigma's core goals, to recognize and disseminate groundbreaking research that improves the lives of people in every region of the world. We value our strong working partnership with Sigma and our shared history, especially in the work we do together to publish the two top-notch journals. On behalf of Wiley, I would really like to congratulate these incredible people and thank them for the work that they do in advancing world health. Congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Cassie. And our thanks again to Wiley for sponsoring this presentation. Now, I invite Sigma Theta Tau International President, Dr. Kathy Catrambone, to the stage for the presentation of the 2016 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees. I will introduce 18 of our 19 honorees in alphabetical order to join Dr. Catrambone on stage. Unfortunately, Dr. Linda McGillis Hall was unable to join us here today. Time does not allow me to chronicle all of the achievements of our, our honorees, but you may access more details and abstracts of their work on the Virginia Henderson Global Nursing e-repository. After all the honorees have been introduced, President Catrambone will pose questions to them. And now it is my privilege to introduce to you the 2016 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees. 
Dr. Deborah Watkins Bruner is an internationally renowned researcher, scholar, and mentor. She has been continuously well-funded in leading multidisciplinary teams in studies of patient-reported outcomes, sexual health, large national clinical trials focused on understanding and improving symptoms, as well as studies seeking to improve minority accrual to clinical trials. Her work has led to numerous honors and awards. Dr. Bruner has worked for more than two decades with the National Cancer Clinical Trials Network in the United States. Dr. Karen, Dr. Janet Carpenter. Dr. Janet Carpenter is internationally acclaimed across nursing and interdisciplinary scientific circles for her innovative, substantive, and prolific contributions to women's health research that have revolutionized menopausal symptom assessment and management and improved the lives of midlife women. Major impactful work includes her innovations in self-report and physiological me me physiologic measures of vasomotor symptoms, hot flashes and night sweats, and generation of robust empirical knowledge to inform treatment of menopausal symptoms. Dr. Carpenter has worked to technologically enable the physiological real-time measurement of hot flashes as they occur during women's daily activities. She was the first nurse to lead the development, testing, and refinement of physiological monitoring systems in partnership with two different manufacturing companies. Her direct efforts resulted in smaller devices with greater capacity, more refined analytic software, and simplified data output. Dr. Eileen Collins. Dr. Eileen Collins' program of research has had international impact through the development of innovative strategies that improve physical ability and quality of life in patients with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, peripheral artery, arterial disease, and spinal cord injury. Dr. Collins developed innovative breathing strategies to reduce dynamic hyperinflation and enable COPD patients to overcome physical limitations and return to a more active lifestyle. She was the first to empirically demonstrate the benefit of such controlled breathing, heralded as seminal work in the field by the American Journal of Respiratory and Critical Care Medicine, the American Thoracic Society, and the American Association for Cardiovascular and Pulmonary Rehabilitation. Dr. Elizabeth Corwin. Dr. Elizabeth Corwin's contributions to nursing derive from her vision and leadership in three areas. First, advancing science and increasing awareness of adverse pregnancy outcomes. Second, providing compelling evidence that exposure to racial discrimination during pregnancy leaves a biological fingerprint of disadvantage on a woman. And third, perpetuating her passion for improving perinatal health outcomes by mentoring the next generation of nurse clinicians and researchers. Dr. Corwin's program of research focused on uncovering the underlying biological mechanisms of adverse symptoms affecting perinatal women and found that these symptoms can interfere with prenatal health as well as maternal infant bonding impacting intergenerational family health and well-being. <laughs> Dr. Sonia Duffy. Dr. Sonia Duffy has a distinguished body of work with more than 80 publications, as well as her national and international presentations focusing on community health care education, palliative care, 
cancer interventions, and tobacco cessation. Currently, Dr. Duffy is a member of the Behavioral Cooperative Oncology Group Center for Symptom Management, the Society of Research on Nicotine and Tobacco, the American and American Public Health Association, among others in the United States. And she sits on the National Cancer Institute expert panel to develop smoking cessation majors for cancer patients. <laughs> Dr. Marilyn Hockenberry. <laughs> Over the past three decades, Dr. Marilyn Hockenberry has demonstrated an outstanding record of publications and scholarly activities. She has widely disseminated her work in respected scientific publications, refereed clinical journals, the lay press, invited and referee presentations, workshops, and symposia for both researchers and clinicians. She is an internationally recognized leader and nurse scientist in pediatric oncology. Dr. Hockenberry's dissemination of research and evidence-based practices have made a major contribution to pediatric oncology, both in medicine and nursing. <laughs> Dr. Huda Abusad Hayer. Dr. Huba, Huda Abusad Hayer is a well-established scientist in pain management and palliative care with an impressive record of interdisciplinary and global publications in well-respected and high-impact journals. Her contributions to this healthcare field at the national and international levels have been seminal. In the USA, she was one of the first researchers investigating the phenomenon of pain in children. Her ability to competitively attract funding from different parts of the world attests to her scientific abilities, focus, hard work, and sophistication. Her service to nursing via membership on the boards of national and international organizations speaks to her wide sphere of influence the sustainability of her commitment to nursing education, nursing research, and nursing practice, and her dedication to the advancement of nursing in Lebanon and throughout the world. <laughs> Dr. Hester Klopper. Dr. Hester Klopper has a well-established program of research with a focus on academic leadership development and scholarship, research capacity development, and the creation of positive practice environments in clinical practice and education. She has received over 50 million rand in funding from national and international funders. Dr. Klopper has an impressive record of peer-reviewed publications, in addition to being the author of 25 chapters and books. With an emphasis on scholarly capacity building, she mentors graduate students as well as novice and clinical researchers. Dr. Klopper is recognized for her service to nursing through professional association work, including serving as STTI's first president from outside of North America from 2013 to 2015. <laughs> Dr. Terry A. Lenny. <laughs> Dr. Terry A. Lenny's research is focused in the area of nutrition in persons with chronic heart failure, particularly sodium restrictions as they relate to patient mortality. Over the past 20 years, Dr. Lenny has conducted multiple studies that have highlighted for healthcare providers, patients, and families the danger of having daily sodium intake that is either too high or too low 
and the consequences of nutritional deficiencies. He is among the small handful of nurses conducting truly groundbreaking research related to the care of patients with heart failure. His novel work has directly resulted in improved clinical practice outcomes. Dr. Linda McCauley. Trained initially as an occupational environmental nurse epidemiologist, Dr. Linda McCauley has always been interested in work-related exposures and health effects. She has more than 25 years of experience in conducting interdisciplinary studies focused on occupational and environmental effects on working populations and their children. From 2009 to 2013, she led a large study on pregnancy health among Florida farm workers in the United States. Dr. McCauley's scholarship serves as an important voice from the nursing community on the importance of environmental health for all populations. Dr. Barbara Medoff Cooper. Dr. Barbara Medoff Cooper has more than 35 years of experience as an infancy researcher. She has contributed to the development of the science of care for fragile, influent, for fragile infants and influenced how people think about their care. She is best known for her work with high-risk infants and their developmental outcomes, feeding behaviors, growth, nutrition, and temperament. Through Dr. Medoff Cooper's research-based publications, presentations, consultations, policy work, and the development of interdisciplinary models of care, she has improved the quality of infant outcomes during the first year of life. Dr. Cindy Monroe. Dr. Cindy Monroe's research training in microbiology and immunology, coupled with training as a cardiopulmonary clinical specialist and nurse practitioner, provided her with a foundation for the examination of oral health and biological factors in human health and disease and led to a sustained and substantial program of research that established foundation for her expertise in laboratory examination of bacterial vir virulence factors and clinical intervention research in the intensive care unit. She initiated the use of the animal model of endocarditis at Virginia Commonwealth University in the United States and determined the central role of exopolysaccharides in streptococcus mutans virulence in two diseases, dental caries and endocarditis. <laughs> Dr. Ann E. Norris. Dr. Ann E. Norris is a nationally and internationally recognized expert in the areas of sexual and reproductive health and measurement of a variety of phenomena. She is driven by a passion for improving the lives of individuals from vulnerable populations and empowering them as well as students and nurses with research skills. Dr. Norris's research has furthered the science of measurement. For example, she created a sexual abstinence self-efficacy instrument in Spanish and English, which has further been further translated and used in Korea, Thailand, and Nigeria. Use of her recently created gameplay involvement and peer resistance self-efficacy measures is now spreading to other parts of the U.S., including California and North Carolina. Dr. Rita Pickler. Dr. 
Dr. Rita Pickler is a nationally and internationally known researcher with an admirable body of work in the area of maternal and child outcomes in preterm infants with a particular focus on infant nutrition and maternal stress. Her research has improved care provided to preterm infants in the neonatal intensive care unit, particularly feeding care. Additionally, her exploration of feeding approaches in preterm infants has paved the way for other researchers and has improved the care of this high-risk population. Building on her research, Dr. Pickler is now advancing knowledge and care provision to improve short and long-term neurodevelopmental outcomes in infants who are born preterm. Dr. Anne Marie Rafferty. Dr. Anne Marie Rafferty's multidisciplinary academic background and research practice has resulted in an influential body of research that has had a major impact on public policies improving the welfare and working conditions of nursing and healthcare outcomes for patients and families. She published the first large study in the United Kingdom demonstrating the association between nurse to patient workloads and hospital mortality. Additionally, Dr. Rafferty is, Rafferty is a successful mentor of novice researchers, notably not only United Kingdom mentees, but novice researchers from a variety of countries. Dr. Ora Leah Strickland. Dr. Ora Leah Strickland has a distinguished record of contributions focused on improving the nursing profession, research in nursing, healthcare to the public, and policy development. An internationally known specialist in nursing measurement, research, evaluation, and women's health. Dr. Strickland is frequently called upon as a consultant and keynote speaker nationally and internationally. Her research has focused on multiple aspects of women's health, including studying genetics and genomics, premenstrual symptoms, cardiovascular disease in women, breast cancer, and the prevention and impact of chronic diseases in women. Dr. Peishan Sai. Dr. Peishan Sai focuses her research on the link between stress response systems and chronic illness and outcomes of nursing care of patients with stress-related illness, including hypertension, coronary heart disease, chronic pain, and sleep disorders. She is frequently invited as a sleep expert to talk about factors associated with poor sleep and sleep hygiene on television programs, which has positive impacts on the public's literacy about sleep disorders. In the past 15 years, Dr. Sai has published 128 peer-reviewed articles in medical, psychology, sociology, and nursing journals. She has also co-authored several book checks chapters on ambulatory monitoring devices and sleep technology. She has been continuously funded by the Ministry of Science and Technology of Taiwan since 2003. <laughs> Dr. Judith A. Vesey. Dr. Judith A. Vesey's program of research focuses on bullying, both in the schoolyard and in the workplace. Her research came from her clinical experience and an aberrant research finding from children with chronic conditions who reported different patterns of teasing than previously reported in the literature. She wanted to investigate this scientific gap further 
and soon recognized that no appropriate instrument existed to measure the concept. This resulted in her 2000 study, The Development of the Cats, the Child Adolescent Teasing Scale. This instrument is currently being used in global research and clinical practice. It has been translated from English into four languages, Spanish, Portuguese, Mandarin, and Tegelem. <laughs> Sigma Theta Tau International has long focused on knowledge dissemination, development, and utilization. These neat nurse researchers' careers demonstrate how exceptional nurse scientists can be successful in all three of these areas. Please join me in congratulating the 2016 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame honorees. It is our tradition that the STTI president conducts a conversation with the honorees. Please join me in again acknowledging STTI president Kathy Catrambone as she joins the honorees. Thank you and good morning. We are so fortunate to have such an esteemed and accomplished group of nurse researchers with us today. And what a wonderful opportunity for us to learn and to be inspired by your achievements. And we are delighted to have a conversation with you this morning. So let's begin. First, I would like to focus on the interface between research and practice. So that will be our beginning theme. And the first question is, some members are interested to know how much time you spend in clinical practice before becoming a nurse researcher and whether any of you still participate in clinical practice. So I'd like to open it up first for uh, a response from Dr. Bruner. Thank you. Uh, I was in clinical practice for 20 years before I got a PhD, but I started um, my research career uh, when I got a master's degree. And I was probably in practice about six years. And that was because I was a GYN oncology clinical nurse specialist and patients had tremendous sexual dysfunction. And there was and still is a tremendous dearth of knowledge about female sexual dysfunction after cancer. I remember reading about all the, that cancer does to affect um, sexual function. And then the last paragraph would say, and give specific suggestions. And you'd sort of dump the book upside down trying to find what those specific suggestions were and there were none. So that started my career in research. Um, while I no longer have a clinical practice, as a nurse you're always a nurse and I feel like I do because there isn't a day or a week go by that family, friends, and colleagues do not call about the symptoms and treatment of cancer. So you, you never finish practice even if you finish practice. That is true. <laughs> um, Dr. Duffy. Um, I was in uh, clinical practice as a public health nurse for about five years uh, before I actually went back to get my master's and it was during that period that I was getting my master's that I became interested in research. Um, I um, became very interested in health behaviors as a group and I um, don't formally have a clinical practice. However, um, just a little anecdotal story, I recently, for my research, did some focus groups with cancer patients to get feedback on my smoking intervention. And after the patients gave me feedback, a 58-year-old 58 58 African-American male that had had a partial laryngectomy and a cancer recurrence came up to me and said, um, in the eight years that I've had had a neck cancer, the only intervention that anyone has ever offered me is my nurse said she would do cartwheels if I quit smoking. <laughs> <laughs> yes. 
So I, um, he said, will you help me? So off I went and we, he and I did smoking cessation. Uh, it was a little bit different. It was by text messaging since he had had a laryngectomy and he did quit smoking. And I had emailed his nurse on his clinic appointment to please renew his nicotine replacement therapy and I told her that she now needed to do cartwheels because he had not smoked in about 30 days. So <laughs> I do still do clinical practice. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Duffy. Um, and Dr. Mendorf Cooper. Thanks. So I practiced for five years after my master's. I went from my undergraduate to graduate school right away. I was one of those early adopters to do it immediately um, and practice. And it was really my practice that sent me to my doctoral program. I was seeing preemies. We were saving thousand grammars for the first time, and we didn't really understand what was what to do about them. We didn't understand their development. We didn't understand their, pa their parenting needs. Um, and that really began my work in infancy. Um, but throughout the next 30 years, I practiced as a nurse practitioner part-time. I was a faculty member shortly after I finished my, uh, after I finished my RWJ postdoc, um, but practiced in the afternoon a week, in the summer many more days, and continued to practice. But as a clinical nurse researcher, um, I, have all, I feel like I practice every day. I'm at the bedside with our families. I enroll families with, with my project manager. I also make rounds, nursing rounds, um, once a week with our nursing staff. So I see myself constantly in practice, and, and it always feeds the next idea for me. So uh, I see practice and research totally intertwined in, in my life as a researcher. Thank you, Dr. Cooper. All right, our second question we'll move on to is, what strategies have you used to bridge the gap between your research and clinical practice? And Dr. Collins, if you would like to comment. Thank you. Um, I've been very fortunate in that my research laboratory is embedded in a VA hospital. So we, uh, we see patients both for research purposes and clinical purposes. I find when I spend a lot of desk time, that I need to get back to the laboratory because those are where the ideas come from, the patients that you see in the laboratory. I also think it's important that as researchers we maintain involvement in, in the more clinical organizations so that we can, we can hear and listen to what the clinicians are facing and try to and focus on those areas in our research. Okay, thank you. Um, and Dr. Cowan. Uh, yes, um, this is an interesting question for me. I think that I, um, I entered into, I have a different pathway into nursing that influences my thoughts on this question. I became a nurse after, as a researcher. So my um, original career, I have a PhD in physiology, and then I, was, I studied the underlying physiological uh, concerns related to pain and fatigue and um, symptoms, but I never thought of it from a patient point of view until I decided to get a clinical background, a clinical expertise, and I stepped out of my faculty physiology position and went and got a, a degree in nursing and then a master's as a family nurse practitioner. And so it was during that clinical, those clinical rotations, and then afterwards when I did practice um, as a nurse practitioner, that I, that I put into reality or actualized the work I had done as a physiologist looking at the underlying endocrinology of, of um, endocrinological disturbances and immunological disturbances. And I would see then patients who had pain or fatigue or depression or um, GI problems. And I thought about it as a clinician on one hand, but as a biologist on another. So I still, I don't see a bridging so much as a merging of these two approaches to now be interested in the underlying contribution of chronic stress on health outcomes. I see it as a clinician and I see it as a, as a researcher. There is a true underpinnings that chronic stress makes it makes on our bodies and I um, so I study chronic stress now the biology of chronic stress and the um, immune responses to chronic stress which affect patients um, as well as uh, other animals and uh, so I really see this not as a that the bridge for me was a very 
easy one that was formed by my own background than seeing patients who lived those experiences. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we'll shift gears and thinking back to your early experience as a researcher, was there a person or situation that inspired you to pursue a research career? And I would like to uh, invite Dr. Sai to start. Thank you for the question. Um, there were times when I was frustrated about situation in which nurses carry out physician's order without ever questioning whether the clinical decision has evidence to back it up. That's when I decided to pursue a PhD degree in nursing because I wanted to become an equal partner of other healthcare team members and I want to establish scientific evidence for nurse interventions. And I also want nurses to have a voice in healthcare. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Vesey. I am a developmental pediatric nurse practitioner by background. And so I've always worked with families who have a lot of questions about their kids and uh, the challenges that they were being confronted with. So when I went back for my graduate degree at University of Pennsylvania, I met Dr. Florence Downs, who many of you may remember was the former editor of Nursing Research and also the Associate Dean at University of Pennsylvania. And she was really the one who challenged me um, to take my curiosity and my inability to answer many of the questions that parents had for us on a day-to-day -day basis in the clinical arena and to begin investigating them um, from a really scientific perspective. And she's probably one of several people who imported in me the very, um, how important it is to learn to write and to write well because um, that is so foundational to so much we do it, across the research process, you know, from our IRB applications to our grant applications and to our scientific publications and lay publications at the other end. Good. Thank you. Uh, next question is, what do you consider the most important characteristics of a researcher? And I will ask Dr. Lenny to comment. Um, well, I think there are a number of characteristics that are all highly interrelated that, that'll do, that um, are important. The first one is curiosity, the desire for new knowledge and, to, and discovery. I think the second one is persistence, um, and that relies to that other sometimes dreaded P word, a peer review, um, where uh, often nothing ever gets uh, accepted on the first try. Um, but persistence can be, um, uh, if you have passion for what you're doing, and I think it's essential that you be passionate about what you're studying, um, because that will allow persistence to be an easy part of that as you move forward. And I also think as, as you become a, a senior researcher, that passion has to extend to mentorship of the next generation of, of researchers. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Lenny. Uh, Dr. Rafferty. I think Dr. Lenny's just stolen all my lines. <laughs> Good grief. I was, it's, it's very interesting because we were discussing um, as Dr. Lenny was, was speaking, exactly the same attributes, but we may have prioritized them in a slightly different order. Um, I think I would also add to the list another P, which is power of persuasion, because you have to enroll, enlist the support of a great many people when you're actually a researcher, be that patients, be that fellow academics to come and play with you as a collaborator. Um, but most of all, the constituency, and of course you have to persuade funders and reviewers, mm -hmm. and uh, think about all of those uh, hurdles that have to be navigated and, and negotiated. But of course, most of all, enrolling and enlisting and recruiting the support of those who will be involved in implementing the research, either as uh, as clinicians or as or, or as policy makers. So I think power of persuasion and a good deal of and Orla and I were discussing this earlier on native cunning. I think you have to be pretty shrewd, politically astute, and uh, clever. Know how to duck and dive, and you know, <laughs> research is highly political. And you're operating often in a highly politicized environment, which is, you know, healthcare, the most politicized, perhaps, of any type of environment. So 
good a good dose of native cunning. Um, I'm not sure how you how you quite get the gene for native cunning, but if anyone from the geneticist side of the research <laughs> equation can tell us that, then that would be gold dust for the future. Thanks. Thank you. Excellent points. All right. Our next question is, what cr criteria or characteristics do you consider in determining who to include in your research team? So I invite Dr. Norris to share your thoughts. Well, I think of myself as sort of having two integrated teams. One are the scientists that I collaborate with. And what's very important for me is that they like to work in partnership and they have a reputation for playing well in the sandbox, so to speak, or on the playground of research. And in addition, that they um, share my values in terms of what I want from the people working on my team that are not scientists. And what's very important to me is that the people working on my team feel empowered to speak up and are, are able to recognize that opportunity and to be critical. I really need people on my t team who are willing to push back on my ideas. I don't always agree with them, but invariably we get to a better solution when we have that process going. I think another thing that's very important is that people on, working on my team are able to admit when they're overextended or they're in an area where they don't feel comfortable so that then we can address that and keep the quality of the work at the high level that I want it to be. So, Thank you. And Dr. Pickler. Yes, yeah, so again, I, I would agree with Anne as well here. I think we, we're successful because we do, in fact, surround ourselves with folks who help us out because they bring complementary skills to the skills that we possess. We don't know everything. We can't do everything by ourselves. So having folks who, who bring those different areas of knowledge and skill with them is very important. And indeed, who share an interest, if not a passion, in the same sorts of clinical questions that we are interested in. That certainly moves the team forward. And there are, in fact, is in fact a great need for folks who will challenge us, particularly our, our clinical partners, those who are embedded in the clinical setting, who I do clinical research in the, at the bedside in the NICU who can say to me, Rita, that won't work uh, in this environment, and who can help me, in fact, negotiate how something, a good idea, will, in fact, work in that particular environment. So it is about having folks who are, who are with you and yet who, who enrich your own uh, knowledge and background so that you can accomplish what is good for the, for the folks you're trying to help. Thank you, Dr. Pickler. Now, when we think of the audience here that is participating in the International Nursing Research Congress, we have researchers at various stages of their career. And when you think about our early or beginning nurse researchers, what advice would you give to our novice nurse researchers? And specifically, I'd like to ask, what do you recommend as the most important strategy for jump-starting a research career? And we will start off with Dr. McCauley. Thank you. Um, not only do I study the environment, but I believe it is the most important thing to jump-start your research career. I really believe if you look at the history of nursing research, there were many wonderful, well-prepared nurse researchers but who were not able to be mobile and get to the environment where there were mentors and resources to help them grow their research um, program very quickly. Today, the age of um, PhD students is much younger and you're seeing these young persons having much more career mobility and they look for the environment that will support the launch of that career. And so I think we're going to see more and more nurse scientists as our students are younger and younger. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Monroe. Yeah, and I, I would add that I think probably the most important thing for 
young researchers or novice researchers is to find a really good mentor. Research is a team sport, and you heard the sort of team metaphors. You need people who can fill in your skill set. Research does have a lot of specific skills like perseverance and political strategy making. And if you, on the clinical area, want to learn a skill, you find someone who does it really well and ask them to mentor you in it. Research is the same way. You need to find someone who really does it well, does what you want to do, and then ask them for help in building that skill set. Great. Thank you. Um, Dr. Strickland. understand that there is communism in science. That's very, very important. So in addition to finding the right mentor and getting yourself in an, in an environment where you can continue to learn and grow as a researcher, understand that no discipline, no profession owns any knowledge. No discipline, no profession owns any measurement approach or technique or methodology. It is innovation that brings about new knowledge and change. And that is what we want to do in research. And we will be most likely to innovate when we own all of science, regardless of the discipline or profession who purports to control it. So, if you want to be an outstanding investigator, in addition to being curious and uh, excited and passionate about what you're doing, understand that no one, no discipline, owns science, that we all own it together. Thank you, excellent point. Thank you. Um, what will enable novice researchers to publish successfully? Because certainly that's an area I think that we all struggle with. And I invite Dr. Carpenter to share your thoughts. Thank you, Kathy. Um, the most important thing for publishing is that you have to write. So <laughs> figure out how you're going to be able to write. Um, you might need a lot of noise, you might need a quiet room, you might need to clean your office first, you might need to clean your whole house first, you might need to go on a writing retreat. Try a couple different things, figure out what works. Um, I also always tell my students and postdocs that I see, a sh I see two shifts in um, early investigators writing and one is around the third or fourth paper. Once they've written three or four papers, there's a new level of confidence that comes out and then I see that again around the eighth or ninth paper. Um, so I always have my students or postdocs write three to four papers before we start any grant applications. Um, and then I also often start in the middle. So um, it's so easy to write a methods section and you're a third of the way done when you're done with that. And then I always write the tables and, f and figure out the figures first. Um, because once you have those lined out, then you can go back and write your specific aims, your question, your purpose. So really I think it's about personalizing what you need to be successful and making sure you create that environment to do that. Thank you. Um, Dr. Hockenberry. I think that the best advice I can give is to um, plan before you begin. And I so often see ju uh, junior researchers thinking that they have to wait to the end of the study to actually start writing. And so uh, a publication plan really is so helpful to a research team to outline exactly what the papers you want to get out of this study. And so if you think of a conceptual paper because uh, of our, uh, the way that we look at a problem, if you think of a methods paper, um, in general that talks about sort of the design or something unique to your study and then of course the, the analysis papers and we also uh, very early on look at who's going to be first author who's going to be senior author begin to establish that we make tables to put all of that in so it's understood and I really think it gives you focus on what what you can actually accomplish with one study thank you very much and then our uh, next question Given that STTI is an international organization, what can we do to facilitate collaboration among researchers around the globe? And I invite Dr. Abusad Hayer to, for remarks. 
Thank you very much, uh, Kathy. This is a wonderful question for me. We just established, actually, two years ago, the first uh, Kai Iota chapter in the Middle East, and our constituents there are asking, you know, what are the benefits that we are getting from SDTI? And so I, my answer to them always, you have a wonderful network of researchers around you. I mean, you can benefit from all the things that SDTI offers, but I think SDTI can do more. And I'm going to provide two possibilities for um, um, facilitating research and research collaboration internationally. The first one, I think, uh, and it, it is really within the possibilities that STTI can offer, is to establish what I call virtual networks. And I think you have a wonderful database now that you can sort of bring people together based on their research interests and bring them together virtually. And I think that might provide a platform for people and to start talking to, uh, to one another about research and research collaboration. The second one, I would say, provide seed money that requires people to work together. And I have a very good example, actually, when I was in the Netherlands, the Minister of Health then was really very, very shrewd, and she only uh, earmarked money for research in the field of palliative care if people work together. And so she brought the universities together only through the research funds. So I, my advice really to you, and I would, I would hope it will materialize, that we will create seed money re requiring people to work together internationally. Thank you. I'm Dr. Clapper. Well, I think uh, first and foremost, uh, often what I find is that members are not aware about what Sigma is facilitating. For example, the opportunity to be part of communities of practices on the circle uh, using that network, the access to the Virginia Anderson Library. So that given, what can we do more? I think, and of course that's a huge challenge, but it is, um, you need money to do research. and really accessing more funding for novice researchers from around the globe, where it is um, not focused at just the accessibility of certain um, people from certain parts of the world, but that it should be open for everyone. The other um, suggestion that I would make is that lately what I see is that there's a lot of networks around the globe, but it's becoming important that there's a connection between those networks. It is not in the stage where we have to just establish all of these networks. They are there, but the connection between those networks, I think, needs to happen. For an example is um, the network of deans around the world. Um, really looking at what does it mean to engage in the scholarship of teaching and learning and what, how the, that plays out around the world, uh, looking at standards of education around the world. So just connecting some of the existing networks, I think would, would be extremely valuable in moving uh, work forward and providing the platform for researchers to access and engage in that process. Thank you, Dr. Clapper. One of the advantages also of having a, a panel here to speak with our members, um, we it would be, an interesting opportunity to learn a little bit more about you also personally. And I would like to just open this question up to everyone on our, on our panel here today. And on a lighter note, um, to share with us maybe one of the funniest or most interesting experiences you've had as a researcher. And so I will just open that up to anybody on our panel who would like to comment. And I hope everybody would like to say something. <laughs> I received my PhD in my 20s. And I was very committed to nursing and getting research out there. And uh, so I engaged a lot in uh, consulting and doing workshops uh, in all over the United States and in the world. So I was invited to do a week's uh, research work workshop in the southern, at a major institution in the southern United States. And I was rather young and, and skinny looking. This was in 1985. And um, so they, of course, there was no internet then, and so no one knew what I looked like or how old I was. So uh, they would always meet me at the airport. So this instance, the lady was standing, I got off the plane in, in the southern state, very southern state, and the lady was standing there with a sign that says, Dr. Ora Strickland, 
So I walked up to her and I said, you're waiting for Dr. Aura Strickland? She looks at me in the face and says yes and looked around me <laughs> with the sign. And I said, um, I'm Dr. Aura Strickland. She says, oh my God, I was expecting a little old fat white lady with big boobs. <laughs> Oh, that is a story. <laughs> oh, please, so our next, somebody else would like to comment. <laughs> well, that's a tough act to follow. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about one of the most interesting experiences that I had, which was um, being on an aircraft carrier for the U.S. Navy. I met the carrier in Hobart, Australia, which is part of Tasmania, and then sailed with them all the way into Pearl Harbor. And it was an amazing experience in so many ways. I was there because I was directing and training a young naval nurse researcher in how to conduct a survey of HIV risk behaviors. Um, but I just fell in love with the community there. It was very inclusive. People deliberately involved you in conversation, even though they didn't know you. Um, and I was also impressed with how hard our men and women in the US Navy work and how dedicated they are. And it was just an amazing experience. And being on the inside of the carrier, because I couldn't go outside, as we sailed into Pearl Harbor, where all the Navy personnel s stood at attention around the ship as we sailed in, it was very moving. And I was sad when I finally had to leave. I know my husband was going to be happy to see me, but <laughs> I really did not like to leave this community. So, Thank you. I just had a, a funny story about data collection early on in our um, experiences of looking at childhood cancer symptoms. We used Actograph, and we were looking at this one um, little girl's Actograph, and it was off the chart. We couldn't, and she was newly diagnosed with cancer. We couldn't believe it, and so I went to her and said, "What was going on that day? What were you doing?" And she um, owned up that she had put the Actograph on her cat for the day. <laughs> So I, I do sexual function research, um, and so I lecture on the topic a lot, and um, I bring uh, show and tell with me. And when um, they first started with the scanning at the, uh, at the airport, um, I have a glass ball that, if you imagine, that looks like something that, you know, the uh, seer looks into, except out of the glass ball is a penile implant. And if you hit it, it goes limp. And if you hit it again, it goes erect. Um, so I go through the scanner, and a very big gentleman calls me over and says, we, we have to look in your bag. So they take this thing out. And he's standing there, and there's a woman next to him. And he's looking at it. And then they pour, start pulling out lubricant and vaginal dilators. And he's looking at me, and he says, what? is this? And I said, do you really want to know? He dropped it like it was going to sting him. I put everything back in my bag. I went on to my lecture and I said, whatever went on in his mind was so much better than anything I could have told him that these things were for. Thank you. Well, just the opposite for me. I also have a feeding device, and I was going to Israel and bringing it to my colleague um, and how to go through the security. Uh, and um, I, had, I had a really hard time convincing them that it wasn't a bomb, that it really was a feeding device. Um, and they really needed to let me go, because I really needed to take this to my colleague who was waiting for it, because he had subjects already lined up. Um, and, and we did a little dance, and finally, after they saw all my passport that I'd been going back and forth, they had all my papers, they, they finally did let me go with it. But it was a little touch and go for a while, and I was concerned, A, that they would confiscate it because it, was a lot, it, was a, it took a lot to get it built, and B, that they put me in jail. But nothing <laughs> happened. I got to Israel, and we were fine. Well, 
um, as many of you know, when we get research participants into mm -hmm. our studies, um, we, off, we take care of what we need to take care of with the research, but sometimes we end up trying to take care of some of their clinical needs or their social services needs as well. Um, and we had a patient who um, was on oxygen at home and was declining as time went on. And he said he, he could really use a wheelchair. So we worked very hard with our social work department to find uh, this gentleman a wheelchair. And about a month later, he came back to the lab and he was sitting talking to, the, to, to all of us, to our staff. And he said, geez, you know, thanks for the wheelchair. He says, I'd really like to show you a picture. Um, so he pulled out a picture um, of the wheelchair, and he said, this wheelchair is the greatest thing. Do you know how many cases of beer I can fit on a wheelchair? Oh, no. so. <laughs> I was thinking about our data collection also, and we have an ongoing um, study now, an uh, NIH study of the microbiome in um, pregnant and uh, postpartum pregnant women. And so we collect, we ask women, they collect, and it's, an, uh, it's a study of African American women in Atlanta. And we ask them to collect um, oral, vaginal, and gut microbiome. And we thought, oh, I don't know if people will do it or not, or how, how they might do it. And we also ask them if we can cut a little piece of hair so that we can look at chronic stress and cortisol over time release. It builds up in the hair. And so we um, thought people would, women would say they wouldn't weren't comfortable giving vaginal or, or rectal microbiome samples. Nobody ever refuses that at all. That's easy. No, they don't even think twice about giving us samples of, of anything, except almost none will give hair samples. And they just, be, and many have braids and, or um, short hair, but that's the one thing that we didn't really anticipate that we would not get any hair samples. And then our whole team, we have lots of students on the team team and postdocs and junior faculty and everybody wants to do the microbiome samples because it is kind of interesting to see what what you have but none of us will give our hair samples either so you know you, it's like you never know what is going to be the stickler in a study so we really don't have any cortisol measures <laughs> uh, <coughs> My research is on bullying, and I actually began doing a lot of the work on teasing and bullying several years prior to the Columbine shootings in the United States. So after those shootings, um, I became a talking head on TV, and I found myself live on CNN with a really well-known TV um, talk psychologist, and then there was me. And she begins talking all about bullying, and she is giving completely wrong information. And every word out of her mouth just made things worse and worse. And then they turned to me and said, and Dr. Vesey, what do you think? <laughs> I really wanted just to disappear through the floor. Um, but fortunately, I had learned some good lessons when I was a student at University of Penn about managing the media, and they came to the forefront of my mind about how to just take off on a different tangent and present a different worldview. But I was really nervous. And I, I'll pick up on the idea of unanticipated things. Um, our intervention involves brushing teeth in patients who are mechanically ventilated. So you have to work around the endotracheal tube. It's, it doesn't sound like brushing teeth would be hard, but it's actually pretty tricky in this population. Um, and we uh, have been very successful in enrolling people. They're willing to work with us and um, let us do the tooth brushing. But we did have a, a subject a month or so ago whose wife said, well, he, I would like for him to be enrolled, but you can't really use any toothbrush. He's allergic to toothpaste. <laughs> and I'm like, okay, that's the first time I've ever heard of a toothpaste allergy, but we just went with it. <laughs> um, some of the work that I do, I use small physiologic monitors uh, to measure hot flashes, and um, the company had these bags that were just ugly, and the women didn't want to wear the hot flash monitor because they didn't like the look of the bag. <clears throat> so um, I ended up going to the fabric store and getting some vinyl and sewing these little pouches for the women. 
and um, they, they liked them better and they were willing to wear them until we had one participant who didn't think that the black bag went with her outfit and wondered if she could get them in different colors or different fabric or, and I was like, no. Like, I, it was just crazy, so I learned. <laughs> on a serious note, um, I, I have done work in the Netherlands on end-of-life care and um, with the notion that, uh, you know, independence, autonomy, the people sort of planning their own life at the end of life, uh, planning for their families and all of that. I think this was sort of the notion that I took with me to Lebanon when I started doing palliative care in Lebanon. And my big surprise there was, with the first study, that people did not know about their diagnosis. And, um, you know, I, I took it for granted, although I come from the culture, I took it for granted that, you know, end of life care, you know, people know about their diagnosis and they should be prepared for it and all of that. And it was a very big eye opener for me. And I think this is a lesson learned, I would say, that sort of don't uh, uh, transplant things from one culture to the other. And it took us a while really to sort of even talk to the physicians and convince them that people have the right to know what they have and their diagnosis and prognosis. And uh, it was a story actually that sort of transcends everything that we have done. Uh, fortunately now things have sort of gotten a little bit better, but the, the, the being able to communicate, you know, bad news and being able to tell the, the person, you know, what they have and to be able to do your research in that field was, was quite a challenge and still is actually. So that, remi so that reminds me more on a lighter note, but picking on the same trend and that is the lessons that I've learned working across the globe is the different use of um, what we would call a glass uh, in one country and opposed to a glass in another country. And, and I can just quickly think of two. Um, and the first is, for example, once uh, I was trying to navigate a colleague that had to come and meet with me in office. And I was just trying to explain to her, the, and this was in North America, and I was trying to explain to her how to get to the office. And I would use words like, and then you cross the robot and there was the silence, because we would call a traffic light in South Africa a robot. And she were like, not. So that was the one. The other one, and I was contemplating if I should share this, but I'm going to do it anyway. Once again, in North America, the car gave some problems. So I, my husband said to me, um, take it to the garage and have them look at it for you. So I walk into this mechanics. Um, garage and I say I've got a problem with my hooter <laughs> and he's like what <laughs> and I could see on his face uh, I've touched the wrong button there's something that doesn't resonate and in South Africa the hooter of a car well what in North America would be called the the, um, the horn we call it, call it the hooter <laughs> I've just since then learned, be very clear what you say and where you say it. Yeah. And, and so we're kind of on a theme of communication. And I think we all think we've, we communicate pretty clearly. And particularly as nurses and healthcare providers, we probably think when we tell our, the folks we're giving care to or the folks in our research and we give them some instruction that they've got it right and we all know we talk about discharge planning getting people prepared for discharge there's ju just like no such thing of people being prepared so this came home to me well over 10 years ago we were doing a, a supplemental study I'll give Linda Monqua who was a a minority fellow on a supplement to my R01. We were doing her uh, study and we had added a two week post discharge um, visit for uh, mothers and babies whose babies had been in the NICU. And my study was about feeding. So we're talking, but Linda was looking at uh, maternal, um, some maternal well being measures. But we were talking to this mom. She brought these ba this baby back in for. Um, the two-week post-visit, and of course, well-documented that she'd had all sorts of pre-discharge education and preparation, which was not part of our study, but just part of general clinical practice. And so we asked her how things were going, and she said, just fine, simple question here. What 
you know, is it okay if milk comes out the baby's nose? Well, no, <laughs> not exactly. So, you know, we think she was pretty sure that wasn't an okay thing, but nobody would really gone over with her how to feed that baby after discharge, how to make the progression for the baby's feeding to go forward. But of course, it was well documented that she was perfectly prepared for discharge. Our communication skills are lacking. I had a similar with communication skills and also cultural differences. When the first study we did, when we did food diaries in our, in our patients, and we live in landlocked central Kentucky, and uh, I had a, a student from uh, the Middle East who I tasked with entering the diet diaries, and uh, I thought I did a pretty good job of showing him how to do all that work, and we got a printout from one of our patients, and, and it didn't look quite right, so we went back to the original diet entry, and for lunch on one day he had entered that this woman had eaten one small alligator for lunch. So, so, so I think I still needed to do some additional work with him. <laughs> okay. Has everybody had an opportunity to share? Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for your um, wisdom. Um, for getting close and personal with us today. Uh, we really appreciate it. And let's give our panel a round of applause. And I just want to add that um, we only had a short time here together with our researcher Hall of Famers, so I hope that um, that everyone in the audience says that you have the opportunity um, to meet uh, over the next day and a half, that you take the opportunity to um, interact with our uh, researchers and to have the opportunity to share. So thank you so much. So that was insightful, inspiring, humorous, and very energizing. And we are so thankful to be able to celebrate with you all today. Your incredible accomplishments. Please join me in congratulating them one more time, our honorees, as they leave the stage. And again, thank you, Wiley, for sponsoring this wonderful program. And I'm pleased to announce that Wiley has agreed to sponsor the 2017 presentation once again. Thank you. Nominations are now being accepted for both the 2017 International Nurse Researcher Hall of Fame and the 2017 Emerging Nurse Researcher Awards that were presented yesterday morning. These awards recognize nurses whose early or long-term research has impacted the nursing profession. Nominations are due the 7th of December, 2016, and visit the STTI website for more details. You'll find more information about next year's Congress on the website, and we look forward to seeing you all in Dublin. Be sure to join us for lunch immediately following this session. Lunch will be served at the Convention Hall foyer. Thank you, and enjoy the rest of your time. <laughs>